have in hand for a little bit. And so I, I, I'm hoping I can catch up on this. Um, you mentioned that it was a scorched prayer. Um, one thing we uh, thought of with this is a lot of like a cell phone that many of you now have smartphones instead of the old flips. Uh, we did run across somebody who uh, did manage to patent that, though. So now it, it intelligence spray systems, uh, technology that we're working with, we, we can't use smart sprayer anymore uh, because of the trademark. But it, it is that same sort of thinking is letting technology um, integrate into um, our devices or our systems and, and do the work for us uh, because they can be smarter and quicker and more efficient than we can in many times of cases. So today I'd, I'd like to just give you a bit of an overview, particularly for those of you who haven't heard about this, this work, uh, about what we've been doing, and then to uh, talk a little bit about our current research and then some of our plans as we go forward with this research. We have learned that using sensors, so we don't spray the empty spaces, we reduce the volume of pesticides applied by 47 to 70 percent. Uh, I, when I was at UC Davis and um, uh, studying for my master's degree, one of the departments I, I uh, had as a, in the interdisciplinary program was ag engineering. And I remember sitting in my ag engineering class, my ag application technology class, and hearing the efficiency of ag sprays is 1%. And I, I heard that and I said, well, that sucks. <laughs> I'm not an engineer. I can't do anything about that. I'm more of a biologist, I, so I'll do my best to try to, to bring efficiency in through my, my knowledge of biology. Uh, but what happened was that we managed to hook up with some very good engineers um, in, in, to work with this new technology. I say new, actually, because it has been around for a long time. That same ag engineering class taught by Ken Giles at UC Davis, and he was really one of the major folks uh, behind using sensors uh, on ag sprayers. And at that time, he was working with Caltrans, uh, uh, the transportation department in California, to design um, roadside sprayers that detected the weeds as they went down the road and only sprayed where the weeds were. Uh, so it's been around for a long time, but just like your cell phone, I don't, some of you are old enough to remember what those first mobile phones looked like. Mine came in an attache case. It weighed, I don't know, 15 pounds, 15 pounds. It was mobile, you know, we were no longer tethered. But but yeah, nowadays, you know, there are phones like this big nowadays that do more than I even want to try to learn. Um, so so things are moving pretty quickly. We've learned about those tremendous uh, um, reductions in the volume uh, with our first specialty crop research initiative grant that funded five years of research in nurseries. This is a multi-state, multi-agency project that is led by Dr. Hepping Zhu at the Application Technology Research Unit of USDA ARS based in Worcester, Ohio. In addition to the USDA scientists, we have researchers at um, for this project, three different universities. Ohio State was involved. We also had the uh, University of Tennessee, and I was the lead or and only principal investigator for Oregon um, during that initial research. In those five years, um, we did quite a number of trials in these various states. We were lucky here in Oregon that we actually had the opportunity to work with multiple prototypes of this was actually our first prototype. There we go. You can see this is actually a modified GK over the tree row sprayer. It's got a 30 foot long boom here, and you see the six free um, spray base there. Pointing over here too for you guys. <laughs> um, this used ultrasonic sensors. Uh, this particular design. And uh, you can see that the retrofit on the right side of, of the sprayer here, uh, each one of those spray bays had uh, multiple uh, ultrasonic sensors. As the sprayer goes down the row, the sensors detect the plants. The size 
size, width, and height of the plants, sends that information to a microprocessor unit, uh, and that um, basically uh, uses algorithms to send information to solenoids to adjust the flow of the, the spray to match the characteristics of the plants in the row. So if there's a plant there, spray, there's nothing there, you turn it off. Pretty simple in some ways as it went down the rows. That was our initial um, prototype. We saw about 40 to 50 percent reduction in pesticides working with that one. But then we shifted over to um, using a, a newer, what we thought was much better uh, prototype. And in this case, there are lasers. There's one laser sensor. We don't have multiple sensors on here. In the time that we did this research, in that first uh, five years, that laser went from $10,000 down to $5,000. So it's, it's the most costly part of um, this particular um, system that we have on the sprayer. There are multiple components on this um, system. I'll kind of walk you through it. So up on the upper left, there's, there's that sensor I, I talk about. It's very small relatively, and in general, in this prototype, it's in front of the spray tank. We also have in the cab an embedded computer with a touch screen. That touch screen allows the operator actually to customize some of the operation of the sensor. For instance, they, um, in a nursery, uh, you might have several rows, but you have different plants there, and you don't want to spray all of them. Maybe you just want to spray one row over. You can tell the sprayer, um, you know, I only want to sense this row. And you can also see all of the nozzles operating on the sprayer whether they're firing or not. We have, on this particular design, you see sort of a, a tower configuration with the um, four five-finger nozzle systems on either side. And I want to mention, each one of those nozzles are independently operated by this system. It's a multi-channel system on this sprayer. Here's the control box on the lower left side of, of the screen there for you, and that's all solid state. It's color-coded for ease of maintenance, so um, everything is color-coded throughout the system so that you can see what's happening, basically, if there's a line that's clogged or that sort of thing, you can kind of change things through the system. There's a Doppler speed sensor on the bottom so that the information about the speed of the, the sprayer, the tractor, um, is sent in and as part of the algorithm. Um, so if you're going three miles an hour, or maybe you're, you start going down a hill, you things go up to four or five miles an hour, this thing can adjust for those sort of things. In real time. On the uh, lower right, you, you start seeing some of the uh, pattern, that information that is coming through with the laser sensor. This one, I, I mentioned the ultrasonic can uh, detect the size, the width, the height of the plants. This one, the, the, the resolution of a, like, information with the laser versus the ultrasonic, that we can also assess the density of the plant there. So, and again, adjust that flow at a, a more sensitive um, amount. Um, and at the, uh, the top there, the top right, you see that um, pulse width modulation flow control valves, or PV, TWM, TWM. I didn't know much about that. What I've studied with it, it looks like, and I'm not an engineer, I'm definitely a biologist, but uh, it adjusts the uh, proportion of the frequency of time that a, a, a nozzle basically is either spraying, in this case, either spraying or, or at half flow or, or off. Um, so that proportion changes over time. So this is our proof of concept sprayer that we have out there in a number of different situations. A little bit more information. The, the um, laser on here is, is extremely sensitive. It can detect about a quarter inch wide, uh, and even slightly less uh, a, a type of an object. So uh, we tested this out uh, or demonstrated it at the North Willamette in the raspberry breeding plots. So, um, it must have been about five years ago now. And um, there was a break, one of the selections had, had been taken out. And uh, we could see it going down there. We saw the two wires in the post. 
and, and you can see it, um, you know, fire at the post. But the operator being able to see on the screen each one of the nozzles going, he said, no, 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 it's also spraying the wire as it went down. We, we can detect that with our eyes, but it is that sensitive out there that it will spray with that. We'll uh, detect 30 meters or 90 feet on either side of the sprayer in a 270 degree radius. So if you have pretty tall plants, that sort of thing, this thing's going to be very sensitive to that. I think one of the weaknesses that we detected with this particular design of this prototype is we, we struggle in the nursery system to get it to um, effectively hit some of the very low plants, the liner systems that we have. So we're, we're trying to work with that system, but um, I, I think we'll, we'll get a lot more information on it. But in general, we've been able to uh, get very good sprays with, with most, most heights of the plants. Um, one of the things that happens with the laser is that it comes in and it basically sort of takes for each one of those nozzles, it, it, it's siding on um, a, a part of the, the canopy all the way up. So that information is, is taken as this thing goes down the road. But really, what I think shows you what goes on here is, is best seen in a video. So I want to get this thing going. It's going to work for me here.
So if you turn off the system, it sprays just like a normal sprayer. It's just all nozzles are firing in just one continuous plume like a normal sprayer. So we compared those out in the field, and what we found that is that we reduced spray loss on the ground by 68 to 93%. Now I have growers who come out and see this thing demonstrated and put their spray spray it right up against it and, and spray it down there. We put moisture sensitive cards out there and one of the things they said, you know, we've got the drip check nozzles on there so we don't have drip. But then they saw they were still spraying out the same amount of stuff. It, just, it wasn't drifting up there, but it was going on the ground. All the moisture sensitive cards were saturated down below. So it keeps the, the aerial drip down, but if you're still close to pushing it out, it's got to go somewhere. So that's what we found with the ground non-target losses. When we looked at spray loss beyond the trees, we saw that we reduced spray loss beyond the tree canopies, canopies from 40 to 87 percent. The, the greatest reductions is early in the season when there's not as much canopy and there's more empty space. If we're not spraying that empty space, we can save a lot of volume of the pesticides. Now one of the things we did when we, we worked with was, this was go the extra mile. The whole reason you spray is whether you control a pest, right? So a big part of this uh, work, this research, looked at efficacy. Uh, so in the nurseries, we looked at diseases and insects as much as we could. We looked at powdery mildew on the maples. We looked at aphids on things like oaks. We looked at rust on ornamental pears. We looked at a little midge on honey locust trees that Oh, there we go. Um, it can uh, make bull dolls on uh, all of the little leaflets on those trees. We also looked at a saw fly that generally these come to the bottom of the canopy and they, they skeletonize the leaves. And what we found in all of those cases, and all of those, I did nine trials up here and it's consistent with all the other trials, we saw no difference in efficacy with these large reductions in the volume of pesticides. Statistically, no difference in the efficacy. And what we actually saw in general um, sometimes was an enhanced coverage in more, more droplets uh, on the um, leaves. We also looked at the cost. Everybody cares about that. In, the, in those first five years, we looked just at pesticide cost. And as you can see here in these uh, types of graphs that we have here, with the laser guided sprayer, our intelligent spray systems. We are coming in quite a bit below the cost for the just the chemicals. Now I know chemical costs may or may not be a big part of your budget, but it's it, it's certainly an expense. But you know there was this time when there was this almost sudden transitional shift when I went to grower meetings and that they they stopped talking about the size of the bonfires out there in the nurseries and started talking about the limitations of labor. So one of the other things we, we knew we needed to start tracking as we went with this research was, was looking at labor as well and some of the other costs. And so that's one of the next things that we plan on doing. So I will mention, and I don't have it up here, I have learned in Tennessee in a nursery where they have looked at that, they have shown an approximate reduction of 50% in the time for application. So I know in nurseries, the spray position is definitely a limited position labor-wise. Very hard to get uh, somebody who can pass those tests and, and, and reliably be there in, the, in all the places you need. If you can cut that, that time down that that person um, needs for, to spray a, a, a certain area, it, it's huge. Um, and, and what we're, also, we're finding is one tank goes three to five times as far. So you don't have to refill that from a safety point of view. The concentrate, the exposure and mixing um, is the, the most dangerous time when you're um, working with chemistry. So to reduce the number of times you do that is huge. For some areas, some crops, just even using dealing with the water for, um, in places like California with large acreages they have down there, they have to have some kind of water truck that comes behind them the um, sprayer to, to work with the refills on some of those really large acreages. So, so these are some of the things that we're thinking about when we look at this. But so we learned in those first five years that we have sometimes more uniform cons and consistent coverage. We have 40 to 80 
percent reduction in the spray loss on the ground, ground. Uh, 87% reduction in airborne spray drift, and 68 to 93% reduction, oh, I'm sorry, that's the spray loss on the ground, uh, 40 to 80% on tree loss. That goes right between the trees. We also saved 140 to $281 um, dollars per acre um, just on the chemical costs. No fuel, no time, none of that. Um, so again, like I said, we, we wanted to look at that further. So when folks started seeing these numbers that we came up with in the nursery systems, we were asked, can you look at this in other cropping systems? And we'd like to see those same results in, in what our system looks like. And so that's really where we went next. We expanded. Um, we added more logos. We've got three more universities involved. We've got Clemson now involved. We've got University of California Cooperative Extension. Now we have Texas A&M all involved. We've now expanded. We're still doing nursery research trials, but we've expanded into nut crops, tree fruit. There is some small fruit work being done um, in Ohio. I think Clemson is doing some of that as well. Uh, and viticulture as well. So we've got that proof of concept uh, prototype down in Napa. It's a narrow, skinny little thing that we had to customize for their quarter foot spacing and that really high value land down there. But we're going to have made up recurring dollars to USDA for this research. So uh, a fair amount of it is going to Worcester at the Application Technology and Research Unit. But we've got $175,000 for here in Oregon. Based on that, you know, that hard work of lobbying for our, uh, you know, a very important project with a lot of results. So we're going to be able to look at this for a long time. There's quite a few plans for things like direct injection systems so that the chemical is basically mixed as you go so you don't have a leftover tank of stuff that you have to figure out how to spray. They've got all kinds of things they want to add down the road. But first we're going to test out these simple concepts. Um, so. That really ends kind of my, my, my spiel on this, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll stay around for later, and I don't know if we have any time right now. But, I mean, I've got one which is commercialization. Where's that connection going to come between all this research and actually getting a commercial product? So the question's on commercialization. Yeah. That's an excellent question, because I've been here a long time, and I've seen some things just wither on the line. <laughs> But this needs to be really robust in the field. Um, and it's something you were really interested in. And I have to say, with the first SDRI, we, we kind of learned that it is difficult for local companies like GK, for instance, has been very interested in right here, right from the beginning with this research. Um, they were having difficulties finding out how to get the tech transfer aspect of this worked out. In a way, I think that's kind of good, because I think this retro that might be working may end up going. We actually have surmised that maybe would sell a kit. It might actually be spray systems or somewhere where you go for spray or accessories that you might buy these things down the road. Uh, but one of the things we did with this with, with our advisory group is a fairly significant over 50 people when we first met was get the head of USDA tech transfer in the room. The, the regional person didn't show up to have the flu or something, but um, we, we, we really wanted this to happen. There's no um, interest at all in, in trying to make money at any of the universities or the USDA on this. We, we want this out there because it's so important. Um, we want that individual <coughs> companies to, to make money. But yeah, I think the local companies need to be involved because I want this technology to be customized for our particular style of horticulture here. So having Oregon in the game is, is pretty critical. I do think it, it is very practical and will pay for itself pretty quickly. They did look at an orchard system um, in terms of cost, and it would pay for itself with a 100-acre orchard in, in, in just one year, uh, 25 acres smaller in four years. So um, it, it will be affordable. We're at that point where we want to create demand and interest so that manufacturers are, are interested in getting in there. And I think they're going to fill it out as to how it works with their lines. But yeah, I'll probably, I'll retire before that, that actually happens. I'm going to go out in about a year and a half. But I think by the end of this, this five year, 2020 is the last season for this particular grant. I'm hoping there's a plan and, and there's somebody already who, who grabs it up. I suspect multiple folks, multiple companies will have an interest. Question, and I'm hard of hearing, so please bell the bell. Um, 
through all this research, I didn't see anything about the amount of airflow that you needed to have. And you can put multiple pitch and blade configurations of fans. So is there a trade-off curve for what is the optimum amount of airflow required for the system based on canopy size? Because I could see of putting on sprays is semi-based on being able to displace the still air within the plant. If you can't go through that still air, you can't put whatever you're trying to put effectively onto the plant. So I didn't see any trade-off curves of airflow versus canopy size. And how is that going to factor into these retrofit kits? It's a lot of questions, so I'm going to summarize <laughs> a little bit. And that, uh, but our, maybe some of the trade-off costs and information as to the airflow and, and pushing the, the liquid to where you need it in the plants. Uh, what I, I, I didn't mention uh, or emphasize that was an air assist, that original prototype. So that didn't push anywhere near the volume of air that you see in an air blast. That actually helped us get those really low air drag. Exactly. Uh, That's my concern with this research. But our coverage, our coverage in those shade tree nurseries was as good or better. Now, we're not trying to penetrate an arbor vitae with that sort of thing. The, the optimization um, or precision that comes with this is not spraying empty spaces. It's not necessarily, if you have a penetration issue, it, it wasn't designed for a penetration issue. It, the retrofit is nice in that if you already have a sprayer that's as optimal as design out there is, it, it's just going to work with that empty space issue. It, it, you're getting that full push with the, these nozzles. These are standard nozzles. So those would be on uh, the retrofits on that. So they're not, yeah, I didn't show all the, the potential air curve reduction because I'm not an engineer and our lead engineer could speak to that because they have done all that. These guys have high speed cameras. They're, they look at stuff at the droplet level. They're using filters and chromatography to get rinse aid to determine what all the drift is. They're doing very highly precise controlled studies. I'm much more on the fuel study side, looking at the efficacy, particularly as a biologist. But I think we'll see more and more of that address. There are a lot of publications, a lot of referee publications with this, so there, there's a, a fairly um, depth-wise. But I think as we move to the retrofits, that, that's a good question. We will still continue to be, do fairly precise drift work, I think, down the road with this. Um, we're just getting these retrofits, so we're getting a feel for how this all works. Uh, but yeah, it, it won't solve all problems. Like I said, for, for most of us, uh, when we look at things like hazelnuts, there's little sticks out there, the chance of reducing huge volumes of, of pesticides is going to be huge. If I look at a crop that has canopy um, for almost from the beginning on, I'm not going to see the efficiencies there. In viticulture, we expect to get a lot of early saving, savings, but once you've got canopy everywhere, it's just going to be like every nozzle on. Uh, so yeah, I, I think fine tuning it, and then when you get it commercialized, each one of those companies is going to run it through their trial specs and what they expect to get coverage from. So there's going to be a lot of refinement with this. This was proof of concept. Same with these retrofits. It, it, a lot of this is proof of concept. But one thing I will tell you is our growers who work with this at, at, at Hans Nelson, they change the spacing of their entire nursery, which is not an easy thing to do because they like what they saw with this. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, I think there is quite a bit of information I can, I can get you connected with our the engineers side of this um, to answer more of those questions. But um, yeah, we just wanted folks to, to know this is happening out there and it's expanding, it's going on. Um, I think it'll be more relevant when they, we start seeing them be over the tree row type of designs uh, because um, right now um, folks and other crops can either spray one to three rows. They don't have that sometimes that same density issue. Um, that we're seeing um, with some of the closed canopies that we see.